Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the sixth meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in 2017. Could I ask everyone in the room to ensure their mobile phones are on silent? They can, of course, be used for social media, but please don't take photographs or film proceedings. Uh, agenda item one is the third evidence session on child protection and sport. And uh, can I welcome to the committee uh, Andrew McKinley, Chief Operating Officer of the Scottish Football Association, Stuart Regan, Chief Executive of the Scottish Football Association, and David Little, Chief Executive of the Scottish Youth Football Association. Um, I think it would be appropriate if we asked the, uh, Mr Little and a representative from the SFA if they want to make a brief uh, opening statement, and uh, it would be brief. Mr Little, would you like to um, make a brief opening statement? Thank you very much uh, for inviting us uh, back this morning. Uh, and my first comment was that the M8 was kinder to me this morning than it was on the 7th of February. Uh, again, uh, I would just like to take this opportunity uh, to publicly thank uh, our 15,400 uh, volunteers uh, for the work that they do in providing uh, recreation and football for, for young people, our 60,000 kids. Uh, again, uh, I think it, it would be fair of me to talk about the contribution that SYFA makes uh, to Scottish society. Uh, again, uh, working on round figures, if you take our 15,000 volunteers, uh, if you take on average five hours per week, if you take an average rate uh, of £10, uh, and if you take a season very uh, conservatively based on 30 weeks, that's a contribution of £22.5 million. Pounds. Uh, I would suggest that the, the monetary value isn't the important thing. The important thing here for Scotland PLC is the activity uh, that our young people uh, have actually got. I would say, and, I, and no doubt I'll answer questions on this, can I say this has been, uh, this has been a school day uh, in that we have learned quite a lot uh, from the process. Uh, and one of the, the things that we have uh, learned is that there is a difference uh, between encouragement and enforcement uh, and we'll talk about that uh, later on. Uh, Stuart or Andrew? Yeah, I'd um, like to echo Mr Little's comments and thank the committee for inviting um, myself and Andrew back today. Um, I'd like to make five points, if I can. The first one is to remind committee members that um, we have just launched an independent review of historical child sex abuse um, allegations or into historical child sex abuse allegations in Scottish football. That work has started with Martin Henry as the chair. Uh, the second point is that we are working very closely with Police Scotland and collaborating on matters of a criminal nature. And the third point is that our board back um, between August and October 2016 have agreed and implemented a board directive to all Scottish FA members, including the Youth FA, in order to ensure consistency of policy and application as far as child protection matters are concerned. Uh, the fourth point is that we are in formal correspondence with the Youth FA in relation to a series of concerns which have arisen through both um, government correspondence recently, which we were copied into, and also evidence given to this committee at the last meeting. Um, the reply to our most recent correspondence was only received last night, and I'm not in a position to comment um, on the detail of that at this moment in time. And finally, for the purposes of clarity, I would just like to advise the committee members of the assistance that the Scottish FA has supplied and continues to supply to the Scottish Youth FA in relation to this matter. Um, first of all, to confirm that over the last six years, um, approximately a quarter of a million pounds of unconditional financial support has been provided to the Scottish Youth FA along with um, financial support to all of our ANAs as part of a programme of investment in something that we call One National Plan. Secondly, that the Scottish Youth Affair and other ANAs benefit from 
free accommodation and facilities at Hampden Park. Thirdly, that back in 2015, February, uh, we offered support on child protection matters to the Scottish Youth FA, uh, which was rejected at the time in favour of finan further financial support. We've also offered um, a range of training and education programmes to all members, um, most recently pre-Christmas with a seminar looking at policy and procedure. And finally, in January of this year, we have appointed a dedicated full-time member of staff to work with the ANAs on matters of child protection, which, to be fair to the ANAs, including the Youth Affair, they have acknowledged and appreciated. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, Alison, would you like to begin? <coughs> Thank you, convener. And I would like to focus, if I may, on the administration of the application process for PG, PVG disclosure requests. Um, in, in evidence to the committee, the Scottish Government suggested that the process the SYFA used to complete applications for PV disclosure requests for submitting to Disclosure Scotland operates differently to some other sports bodies, possibly leading to a greater administrative burden um, on you. So I'd like to understand if you think you are following best practice, but in your evidence to the committee the last time, Mr Little, you suggested that, well, you said on the record, I reckon this year disclosure checks will cost the SYFA £70,000. Um, that you have six full-time staff members and one part-time staff member. I'd just like to understand where that cost comes from, um, because for volunteers doing regulated work in qualifying voluntary organisations, there, there is no fee. And um, Mr Regan has just pointed out that perhaps one of the reasons you turned down an offer of help was for further financial <coughs> assistance. Could you just clarify? Yep. Uh, can I say, uh, in respect of the £70,000 uh, first, the £70,000 is made up uh, of uh, salaries, uh, it's made up of uh, volunteer costs uh, and the sundry items, uh, for example, uh, postage. Uh, so that, that, that figure uh, covers these uh, three areas. Uh, in respect of uh, that, uh, it's vitally important that we know exactly who our members are. In fact, it's, it's a requirement to be able to quote numbers, uh, and this goes to support uh, the One National Plan. I think, uh, I think the, the means that we have adopted uh, is a, an online registration system. Uh, whereby I believe uh, it's nice and simple. Uh, it's, it's evolved quite dramatically over the period where the club secretary has a login, secure login, goes into the system, logs their members. Uh, it also enables SYFA uh, to, to find out who has been checked, who hasn't been checked, and quite recently, uh, we are also uh, working with Police Scotland uh, and quite recently we had to make uh, a referral uh, to the Scottish Ministers and the system that we have was invaluable because it enabled us to be able to give full uh, details in respect of the person that was being referred. It enabled us to answer the questions fully in respect of what we had seen uh, when we were doing the PVG check. I think some other sports uh, <coughs> operate a completely different system uh, and it's a more at-length system, uh, whereas we feel to, to be able to fully ensure that people are going to be uh, checked and compliant with first aid, uh, compliant with other uh, coach education, we need this in-depth system. I, I think what I'm trying to understand is um, if you could clarify why the SYFA rejected the offer of assistance <coughs> from the SFA um, in terms of the significant backlog that we heard about the last time. Uh, yes, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, I'd like to understand if the SFA have given a quarter of a million pounds of financial support to yourselves 
Um, it sounds perhaps as if financial support isn't the issue here. In respect of the, the backlog, uh -huh. uh, the support that was actually needed there uh, was the support for our 239 volunteers out in the community. Uh, it was important that we re-engaged and re-energised and got them working again so that they would process the, the forums. We've also looked at uh, our online system uh, and we're currently speaking to our IT people whereby we're going to put uh, a, a dedicated section for uh, league officials so that they have data, but data in real time as opposed to uh, the older system that was laborious in sending reports out on a monthly basis. They'll be able to analyse that on a, on a daily basis and that will manage the flow uh, of forums and will also manage the requirement for meetings within the individual leagues. Can I um, direct a question to, to Mr Regan, um, convener? I'll bring you in a minute. Mr Little, you don't spend £70,000 on this process, do you? Yes. You, uh, you, you, so th this is equivalent. Let me just, you know, back your fag packet calculation. Okay. This would be the equivalent of, say, two admin assistants, full-time, for a year, licking a great many stamps and envelopes for a system that's supposed to be free. Where, where do you come to £70,000? Can I is it two full-time people on this continually? At, at the moment, it's, it's two full-time, but at the moment we've got uh, another two working on it. Uh, we've got volunteers uh, coming in to, to work on it as well. How many, uh, how many are you processing a year? I, we, should, reminders. we should this year process somewhere in the region of between five and 6,000, I think. So between those six people that you've mentioned... It's a thousand each, and that takes them one. That take that's a full time job for how many people? Two, two full time, two part time. Plus at, volunteer at, support. Plus volunteers carrying out the the checks within the, their communities. I find that very very hard to believe. Yeah, there's also uh, when we, when we move on. Uh, if we talk about child protection in its totality, uh, there's also uh, the operations manager's time. There's my time in respect of the protection panel uh, that we operate. That works out on average about three a day. Three forums processed a day between all of those people. Yeah. Not all forums that come in are processed the forums that come in that are fully completed, f fully compliant, uh, are nice and simple, and that they go through uh, they go through the process. Unfortunately, uh, there's an awful lot of forums that come in. Uh, for example, forums come in where officials aren't registered with SYFA, so we've got to basically encourage the clubs to register said officials, uh, and that all takes time as well. Alison, sorry, I interrupted you. Um, no, thank you, convener. Um, Mr. Regan, the SYFA um, provisionally accepted an offer of support from Disclosure Scotland and, and Volunteer Scotland to clear the backlog of, of PVG checks, but then decided to decline that. Um, I would just like to understand if you know why the SYFA declined that offer and what sort of support the SFA give affiliated bodies like the SYFA. Okay, I'll, um, I'll make a comment myself and I'll ask my colleague, Mr McKinley, to comment further because he's closer to the detail. As far as um, the Disclosure Scotland point is concerned, we've only ma been made aware that they actually turned down the offer of support very recently as this process has unfolded. So we're not fully aware why, why they turned that offer down. Subsequently, since our board directive has been implemented, we have offered support and we've, in January, as I said, put a full-time full, full -time member of staff in place to actually support on all matters relating to the board directive. 
Um, maybe Andrew can comment further. Just, just on the Disclosure Scotland point, just to pick up on, on your question there, um, as Stuart has said, we, we only became aware at the same time as you that they, they, they had been turned down. Um, my understanding of the reason it's been turned down, uh, and I'm just reading this from the same documentation I think you, you will have seen, is that it wasn't the support that um, the SYFA felt it required. And I think there was also a suggestion that the SYFA felt that it would have a, a, a negative impact on morale of their volunteers, I believe, was what was stated. Yeah, can I just ask one further question? Um, yeah, I, I did read that um, suggestion uh, that it might have negatively impacted on volunteers, but it is such a serious issue that I do think it has to be treated as such. And I, I'm still failing to understand why these offers of support have been rejected. Could you just briefly tell us what exactly would make the big difference? What form of support would help you? Yeah. Can I firstly say uh, we welcome the, the appointment of uh, Jennifer Malone uh, from the SFA. Uh, there just answer Alison's question, please. Right. Okay. What, what, what would make the difference? What form do you want the support to take? I think at this particular stage, uh, we, we need uh, the, uh, we're trying to get the ability to bring more volunteers in to do more of the work. It would certainly, uh, you know, assist uh, if we had the the ability uh, to increase staff by another one. Okay, thank you, thank you, convener. But you were getting an offer of help for nothing. The help that was uh, on uh, offer was in respect of the the checking of the forums at the meetings, and and with all due respect, that wasn't the assistance we required at that particular time. Okay. But can I, can I also say <coughs> that we've since uh, had meetings uh, with uh, Disclosure Scotland and Disclosure Services where we've spoken about, about training, uh, we've spoken uh, about uh, process, uh, and uh, we've asked uh, that, uh, that this training uh, be distributed via our leagues because there are still some myths in respect of disclosure checks. One of the myths is that okay, you Listen, we may come to that. We may come to that. Okay. Right. There's a number of people who want to ask questions. Colin. Th thanks very much, uh, convener. Can I ask a question just about the, uh, the, the role of the SFA in terms of overseeing compliance? Mr. Regan, you, you made mention of the, the directives that, that were issued um, in relation to child uh, wellbeing and, and protection. Now, these, were, these were issued in August. 2016. Now, given the fact that the PVG system has been in place since 2011, why did it take till August 2016 to actually uh, implement directives effectively to tell your, your, your clubs to, uh, to, 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 to comply? Quite simply because there was no evidence until recently, until last year, that there was actually a problem with um, PVG checks. I mean, we had had a series of concerns which had been flagged to us um, back to 2014. We were in dialogue with the um, SYFA on a number of these matters. Um, we obviously decided when it came to 2015 that we needed to put in place a process because of the lack of consistency of application across Scottish football. And we uh, took that to our board. We agreed it in August. We then had to get the wording legally checked and it was rolled out in October 2016 right across the Scottish FA member base. You say there was no evidence, is that because there was no problem prior to you making this decision or because you simply weren't aware there was a problem? Well the, the issues that we had were issues of process, um, basically people finding it difficult to deal with the process. I mean one of the points that's been uh, raised earlier is that uh, the youth FA handle the management of PGVs uh, centrally, so they they take on board responsibility for the uh, the the management and and processing of those, which is different to other sports where clubs or associations self, self uh, undertake that, them that's, themselves that's and self problem. declare. Well, that, that's not a new issue. They've done that all along, but it's five years since the process started, and you implement a directive so what, what's happened because the to the Scottish affairs knowledge there has been no issue ra raised with the Scottish affair from members or from members of the public other than 
minor process issues which we've been in dialogue to try and, and resolve. When it came to the middle of last year, we had concerns about how the process was working and we wanted to actually put in place a system that dealt with this matter consistently right across the member base. What, so we did what that. Pro what prompted those concerns? Um, feedback from our uh, child protection and well-being manager, Donna Martin, as far as the application of the, the, that process across Scottish football. The, the sheer from number, conversations yeah. she'd had with um, individuals across the game. The sheer number of backlogs, if, if you like, is, is that what, what prompted that? That was, that was one of the concerns that um, clubs and individuals were finding it very difficult um, for uh, decisions to be made and for process to be implemented um, and therefore we needed to try and put in place a consistent approach to handling this which is what what we did through the board are you happy that your monitoring didn't pick a problem up earlier is that a concern to the sfa that these um, issues may have been in place or are you basically saying it's a, a relatively recent problem um, from our knowledge it's a relatively recent problem other than, as I say, minor process issues which have, have been flagged to us. And I think it's worth saying for the record that at this moment in time, there is no evidence to suggest that there is a problem as a result of the ongoing management of the PGV scheme. There is actually risk, and the issue is risk that we have got to address, and therefore we are managing that to mitigate risk using the directive as the vehicle to make it happen. So, so why, if there's no major problem, have you given member organisations 11 months to ensure clubs are using the PVG scheme? That seems an awful long time. Well, I, mean, I think maybe Andrew can uh, look in place as far as the detail are concerned, but there's not just one action that members have to take. There are a whole raft of issues, and the most serious, as far as we were concerned, was the need for data sharing. Um, because of the fragmented nature of Scottish football, we have over 100 members that coaches could potentially move from member to member and unless that data is shared there is no visibility so the first decision which the deadline for which was last week we asked for that data sharing protocol to be signed by all members that has been been actioned um, there are a series of other steps including training initiatives which have to be taken which we feel whilst is important is not as important as some of the other initiatives we've put in place so we've we've given a little bit more time for several thousand people in in the case of um, the schools and the youth fa and the women's fa to actually go through that pr that procedure 11 months is a, is a long period of time what, what, what i would say though and stuart referred to it earlier on there is we're having ongoing official uh, formal correspondence with the SYFA to understand the specific problem of the PBG, the PBG numbers. So just because the directive uh, uh, compliance may be further down the line, there may be other issues that we feel need further investigation and may go through our disciplinary process. But that will depend on how uh, that correspondence plays out. So uh, just, just one final question. The directive is obviously aimed at uh, affiliated national associations rather than individual clubs no it's all it's it's, it's, it's all clubs we, we can only well we can only do it to our members so it's it's at our member clubs plus affiliated national associations but it then has a time scale for the affiliated national associations to get their members in line but we obviously don't have a direct link with their members so we would then have a right to audit them to make sure that they had got their members in compliance so that's how the directive will flow down and are you satisfied that your affiliated national associations will meet that deadline that you've set? We, we believe they should, and we've brought in an individual to, um, a specific individual, just to assist, <laughs> assist them with that. You said they should, but will well, they? Well, we believe they, we, there's no reason why they shouldn't. <laughs> okay. um, Alex. Vina, good morning to the panel. Um, I was struck, uh, Mr Regan, by your comments in respect of what you described as unconditional financial support to the SYFA. Uh, given the line of questioning that Colin Smith has just uh, taken us down, um, I'm very concerned by that because I'd like um, to understand the relationship between SYFA, uh, sorry, the, the SFA and the affiliated bodies. And we've just heard about the, the chain of events which l led you to issue the directive <coughs> around um, uh, making sure that PVD checks were, were up to scratch. But 
Can you just unpack what you mean by unconditional financial support and what due diligence your organisation performs above your affiliated bodies? Because that's a, quite a worrying phrase. No, I, I disagree because um, when I explain uh, the, the nature of the funding, you will understand that we're, we're giving that funding in relation to the delivery of certain targets um, and certain objectives that have to be achieved. What I meant by unconditional funding was that there is no conditions attached as to how that money should then be spent. The money can be spent by the youth FA on promoting the game. They can spend it on governance. They can spend it on people. They can spend it on training. They can spend it on, on what the, the, they, they want to spend. I understand. Thank you. Um, can you then give us an idea of what kind of um, conditions, obviously we're not talking about the restriction of funding, but what kind of expectation around compliance the SFA had to affiliated bodies prior to the directive being issued? Because it strikes me that the directive is very much a, a tool of last resort. It's not happening, so we need to say absolutely red line time. This has to happen. Prior to that, what kind of um, <coughs> contract or uh, understanding was there between your organisation and the affiliated bodies as to what their uh, duties were with regard to compliance with child protection legislation? Okay, so it's worth explaining again the, um, just how the, the structure of Scottish football operates. We have over 100 members. Each of them are separate businesses in their own right. Each of them have their own um, constitutions, rules, regulations, boards and so on uh, and are responsible for managing their businesses and indeed it would be very difficult for us to tread into their businesses without facing some kind of judicial review. What we have to manage our members is a set of articles and a set of rules and we have a compliance officer who will investigate potential breaches of those rules and only if evidence is brought before us will we actually um, in carry out that investigation. In order to um, tighten up in areas of governance, um, we have around 18 months ago started to look at an um, independent audit of all of our ANAs and we have employed a consultant to carry out that, uh, that work and we've had initially a review of policy and procedure um, and we are working on that to roll that out right, right across the game. It's, it's, we've been through one cycle of that audit, and as I said, it's, it's very soft touch in terms of have policy, our policies in place initially, as opposed to the execution of those policies. However, as Andrew explained earlier, if there are specifics that have been brought to our attention, we will investigate those directly. And I mentioned earlier that we are in formal correspondence with the Youth FA over a number of concerns that have arisen on this matter relating to child wellbeing and protection. And you know, they, the, the, the response to that was given to us last night. Thank you. Just one final question, if I may convene it. The directive seems like a very sort of short life solution to the immediate problem that we face in terms of the backlog of PVG applications that have been unprocessed. What is the, the stage after that? When, when the SYFA is up to scratch with all um, officials now checked and vetted and the rest of it, um, what will your organisation do in terms of the process you've just described to ensure that this can't happen again, that there won't be uh, a slip backwards with the SYFA getting to that position again? Yeah, well, cl clearly um, there's two ways of handling that. The first way is to handle, handle it through the compliance officer and any breaches or any evidence of any breaches will then be in investigated on an item by item basis. But the independent audit that I referred to will effectively be widened so that if there are areas of concern in any particular organisation, and it doesn't have to be the same area of concern in each organisation, that can be investigated more fully and we can I then identify where improvements need to be made. But will you, would, could you be in a position, sorry, just to follow up, with the funding that you described to make that contingent on yes, across the board checks? Yes, we can. And clearly, um, the way that we have described the funding previously is it's performance-related funding. If there is um, failures in performance, then clearly we have the ability not to make that funding available. Uh, for me, however, I think there's, there's, there's a fine balance to be struck between not funding a volunteer organisation 
and providing support to allow them to do tasks which clearly are of, of importance to Scottish football. So I think we just need to get that balance right. Thanks, panel. I just wanted to ask uh, Mr Little a wee bit more about the, the process, just to understand how that process works um, in, in, in terms of processing the forms. So typically what would happen, what would, what, what would happen at the start and then what would be the journey of that application process as it went through your, uh, the various stages of your organisation? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, what actually happens uh, is that a person wishing to become an official uh, approaches a club. Yeah. Uh, the club uh, carry out their due diligence, uh, simple questions, have you been with another club? Uh, what was your role with that club? Why did you leave that club? The ability to, to collect uh, references at that particular point. Uh, and also, and I think this is one of the real important uh, issues here, uh, they also base uh, bringing a person in on local knowledge because inevitably uh, there's knowledge within the community uh, if if there is a problem with an individual. Uh, the club then... Uh, so just for believe that. So th that, that process sounds fine. Um, is that process kind of documented or is every club kind of do it based on what they think and feel at the time or is there a standard for it? There is a, there is a document. Right. Uh, but what we've actually uh, done... Uh, is we've drawn up uh, a flowchart. Right. Uh, and uh, the beauty about flowcharts is that we can send them out on a regular basis uh, via, you know, our uh, social media platforms and put that on to, to the websites. So that, that's happening uh, just now. Okay, so, right, so every club has got volunteers in it, and that's your 230-something volunteers that are processing these initial contacts, if you like, through your flowchart and then documenting the, 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 the output from that? Are they recording that then on your system or system locally or how do they record that? Well, the, the clubs cover the 15,400 volunteers. Right. Uh, what we have is we have <laughs> 239 volunteers mm -hmm. uh, who are volunteers to SYFA right. uh, and they're classified as additional signatories. Right. Uh, so it's not it's not just a case of we've got an official uh, that that's linked to a specific club. Uh, they're linked to SYFA, and uh, when leagues are setting up meetings, they would go to the list uh, and invite as many as they feel uh, they actually need to come along and carry out the checks. Once they've uh, completed the the checks, the ID checks, so that we know that if uh, if a guy turns up and says he's Willie Smith, uh, that we know and we can prove that he actually is Willie Smith. I uh, the they complete the forums. Uh, it's then their responsibility to submit the forums for processing at SYFA. And this is where we, we feed them through the system and then uh, send them on to uh, disclosure services. Now, can I say the beauty about that particular system? Uh, and we've, we've had various procedures in place for 15 years now. Uh, and they came about because of an incident. There was an incident in Glasgow where a person had gone to join a club uh, the club complained to, to, to us uh, that this person was unsuitable. Uh, that person then moved on to two other clubs, and then eventually uh, I received a phone call from that person's social worker to say that we had made the right decision in not allowing them to work uh, with young people. And that was the catalyst for 15 years of work uh, that we realised at that particular time uh, that we were out of step, that we didn't... There was no procedures at that time. Uh, but at, at, at that time, we came across John Harris, uh, who was at Volunteer Scotland at the time, and they were carrying out all sorts of training, uh, re rehabilitation of offenders, etc. 
Okay, so just to be clear on that, does that mean that the process you're operating is more robust than, or sorry, it's got additional parts to it, additional components, additional questions, additional information to it over and above the, the PVG process? I, I think so, I, but the beauty about it is it, it, it's used for a slightly different mm -hmm. uh, thing as well, that within the system, uh, the, each official has a category, uh, a code, uh, and if that person is a code N, that means he's not awarded membership or has been removed from membership. And if he goes to any other club, they will not be able to, to register him. Okay. So in effect, it puts a bar on the, the individual. Okay. okay, just moving that forward, then you talked about in your office, you've got two <laughs> staff who are working full time on processing the applications. Um, and if you add up their costs, plus some other costs, you talked about postage, you talked about volunteer is that volunteer expenses you were talking yes. about right and that comes to your seventy thousand pounds meeting which, rooms right the, okay. the whole so that, that all kind of stacks up so effectively you've got two full-time people working on those yep. so if you're doing between five and six thousand a year by my calculation that means they're having to do one in about 30 or 40 minutes each um does that kind of stack up to what you'd expect how long it would take to to run through one of those applications in your office I, I think uh, I think this is a bit like uh, how long is a, a piece sure, of Sure, some are longer, string. some are shorter, so, of yeah, course. On, on, it will average uh, out. Uh, right. there, are, there are some that are problematic. Sure, of course. Uh, for example, one of, the, one of the biggest problems that we've actually had was with a driving license. On the driving license, it shows up a middle name, but on the forum, there's no middle name. Uh, and in the beginning, uh, you know, we had quite a high rejection rate. I believe the rejection rate at the moment is, is very, very low uh, in that it's under 5%. Okay, so, so that kind of stacks up. £70,000, the two staff, the other costs, the, the rate they're processing them through, that all kind of makes sense. Looking at that whole process, where is, where is or was the bottleneck in that process? The, the bottleneck, uh, there was a, a, a number of factors. Uh, one, okay. one was the, the SYFA structure. Uh, two uh, was the officials. Uh, three was the, the clubs uh, not pursuing the, the individuals to carry out the checks. So there was kind of three... Right. So I'm asking specifically on, if you look at that process flow, there's paperwork coming out at one end and you three, three or four steps and coming out at the other end. What point was holding that up? The reason I'm asking that question is to understand whether the offer of assistance from the SFA and others was focused on the right place or, 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 or not, or what kind of support you needed to fix that problem. I'm assuming it wasn't your admin because I'm assuming that would be an easy place to fix it. You've mentioned it was further upstream with your 239 yeah. volunteers. It was the engagement between the 239 volunteers and the leagues uh, for the setting up of meetings. Uh, that was the blockage uh, right. at that particular time. And your view is that the, an external organisation coming in and trying to put resource in there wouldn't have helped because they wouldn't have had the local knowledge or they wouldn't have understood the process or it would have taken too long to bring them up to speed. Or what, what was the reason why throwing bodies, if you like, at that part of the process wouldn't have helped. We, we had to re-engage with the leagues and we had to re-engage with the, the additional uh, signatories. Uh, during that period, uh, we... What does that mean? Sorry? What does re-engage with them mean? We had to, we had to encourage them to, to get out there and carry out the checks. Uh, during that period, uh, there was... a. Uh, a restructure uh, within SYFA. Uh, unfortunately, there was a period of time when, when I wasn't there uh, and uh, there wasn't a, a chain of command. Uh, that has now been rectified uh, with the appointment of uh, an operations manager uh, who has full powers when I'm not there. Okay, okay. thanks. Uh, Thank you. Clear. Um, I have to say, Mr Little, myself and my colleagues are struggling at times to follow some of the, the answers that you're giving us. So I'm going to ask some very specific questions, if you could please try and answer them very specifically. Your organisation set a deadline 
for completion of PVGs by the 28th of February. Yeah. Can you tell me um, how many of uh, new officials have completed their PVG by that point and how many of those requiring retrospective checks were completed by that point? Retrospective checks were completed in October 2015 uh, when that process finished. Uh, at, at the moment, uh, the, the backlog uh, that existed uh, has now been cleared. Completely cleared? Completely cleared. So there are no outstanding PVGs within the SYFA? In respect of that backlog, there are no uh, outstanding checks, but there are two periods, uh, two spikes within the system. Uh, one uh, is, uh, is February. No, no, I'm, I'm not asking about that currently. So so all of, all of the backlog checks have been done? That process has been completed and people that are not compliant have been dealt with. Okay. And so how currently, how many PVG checks are outstanding within your organisation? In respect to the backlog, nil. No, but in how many outstanding that, PVG checks are there in your organisation as I, of today? As of today, with the new members coming in in February, uh, and, and we get new members in August as well, uh, there's uh, 1,170 new members uh, who have joined the SYFA uh, in February. So there's 1,170 new members have joined the SYFA in February. Yep. And their PVGs are outstanding. There's no one else apart from the group that has joined in February. In respect to season 2017-2018, yes. Okay. And are any of those 1,170 people or volunteers who PVGs are currently outstanding having contact with children? Some of them will have contact, but they won't have uh, unrestricted uh, uh, access. What does that mean? It means they've got to be part of a supervised club environment, that they can come along. The, the process is that a club must have fully uh, approved officials. If they're bringing in new officials, the new official can come into the club, but needs to be supervised, uh, cannot have regular unrestricted access wait regular unrestricted access or no unrestricted access no unrestricted access no unrestricted no. not regular they shouldn't have restricted they shouldn't have access to children uh, without supervision okay and the supervision is with someone who has already been through a pvg with check. officials who have uh, been fully compliant okay and can i ask how many officials have been placed under an automatic precautionary suspension as a result of not submitting a PVG application form? In respect of the backlog, uh, 488. And they are in what position currently? Precautionary suspended. And what does that mean on a practical level? That means they, they, they are completely uh, debarred from participation in any football under the jurisdiction of SYFA. And how long were those 488 people coaching or doing whatever within SYFA before they were suspended? That would vary from official to official. And what access would have they have had to children? They would have had access via supervision. Only via supervision? Yep. Even the, the historical ones? Yep. So at what point did SYFA stop any unrestricted access to children from people who did not have a PVG? That's been in the procedures uh, from day one. And when was day one? 15 years ago. 15 years ago. Okay, thanks. Could I ask Mr Little, <coughs> uh, in reference to what Claire asked a second ago, you referred to season 17-18. Yeah. Was there anything we're missing there from other seasons? No, uh, 1617 uh, was cleared up via the backlog. I was just that was just a turn of phrase or there, there was something else. Yes. No, no, the, the, the point I was trying to make was that the, the new members are in respect. We've got two different playing seasons. That's the difficulty. Miles. Thank you for being here. Um, I think for 
parents I represent to learn that there's over a thousand people without PVGs being involved is something they are deeply concerned about. And I think something um, this committee is. And I have to say, this is a second occasion that we've had both organisations in front of us. And I just do not get the impression that you're two organisations working together to fix this. So is it fair to say there's been a total breakdown in communication in the past and that's still ongoing? Uh, I, I think uh, I think the the appointment of Jennifer, uh, uh, the welfare officer, uh, the well-being officer, sorry, uh, have been positives. Uh, we're in uh, we're in dialogue in respect of that uh, just now. Uh, I I think uh, we are in a far far better place now uh, than we were before. Can I comment on that and say that um, for. 15 years the youth fa have operated a process um, it's only in very recent times that we've become aware of issues um, the pvg check i think it's fair to say um, is not an ideal process there are areas that need to be looked at and i think the government are looking to do that as i'm i'm aware um, one of those for example is that if you haven't been caught your pvg check will come up clean and you will carry on uh, operating in the way that you do. Having identified a series of concerns, what we are now doing is putting in place processes right across the piece to make sure that all members operate consistently. Um, there is no suggestion that there's a breakdown of communication. We have worked well together, but in terms of flaws in the system, gaps, issues that we have with the youth FA, they've now been identified, flagged, and you know, we're in formal correspondence with the youth FA on, on those. And what confidence in future years do you have that this will not be another issue, that we'll be sitting here next year with another thousand people? Who well, to, to be fair, I think you need to understand that the new people, that is normal, that any new person coming into football has to go through a, a check. Right. You know, you, you, cannot, you can automatically be cleared on day one. And in order to make sure that the risk is mitigated, none of those people will be allowed direct access to kids unless they are with people in a supervisory capacity who've been through the PVG. Think, so th that, that is a normal that that, procedure. I think it's fair to say that isn't 100% foolproof, that supervised access. I think that's where concern does exist. And I've not heard anything which suggests that's going to be rectified. I think you're absolutely right, because as I said before, people who haven't been caught from... Uh, inappropriate behaviour with children may be one of the supervisory people that's carrying out that, that work because we, we, we struggle and the PVG scheme itself doesn't capture those issues which is why this area can't be just about the PVG check it has to be about vigilance it has to be about training education, looking for other signs and, and signals and that's part of the process we're putting in place through the wider work we're doing can I just make a comment on, Briefly. on that? Uh, the vast majority of forums, certificates that come back are, are clear. Uh, as, as Stuart quite rightly said, PVG is a bit like a MOT. Uh, but what we have is we have a system whereby uh, the, the clear ones are easy and the people who have committed heinous crimes are easy because they're not getting membership, but that wee grey area that's left, we have a protection panel, uh, and the protection panel sits, uh, the protection panel interviews uh, potential members uh, to discuss suitability, and there's certain things that the disclosure uh, certificate throws up uh, that would debar people from being members. Morning. Um, it's my understanding, F SFA, ruling body for football in Scotland. So, what control do you have over the SYFA? Well, um, the principle of devolved power applies, which um, operates and has operated in Scottish football for years. We're a members' organisation. We devolve power to run different parts of the game whether it be youths, whether it be amateurs, whether it be women, schools, and so on and so forth. The way that that's managed is through a set of articles and disciplinary rules. And if we are made aware of breaches of those rules, or if there are concerns raised with us, 
we have the power to investigate, we have the power to take action, and we have a range of sanctions that are open to us to implement <laughs> if a member breaks those rules. I just need to understand that. <laughs> so do you fully, can you fully control the SYFA or not? Well, it's not about control. It's about actually managing and regulating the game. We're a regulatory body. We don't run youth football. That's the responsibility of the youth FA. We don't run amateur football. That's the responsibility of the amateur FA. What we do is govern and regulate through articles and rules. And you know, every one of those devolved bodies run their, their parts of the game. And we can intervene if there are breaches. Have you, with the greatest respect, called Mr <laughs> Little into your office and said, sort this? We are in the process, as I explained at the beginning, through formal correspondence of trying to identify answers to concerns that we've raised with Mr Little and the Youth FA, um, and that is ongoing. The most recent reply was received last night. Right. Mr Little, um, for the, the comments you've made, and I've listened intently, again, I have to raise, you were... You were uh, offered help in December, you provisionally accepted that help. Then in January, you reversed that decision and said you don't decline. You declined that help. Now I know you you specified why you you declined that help. But at any time, have you approached Sports Scotland, SFA, government, or anyone, Disclosure Scotland, to say I don't need that help, but I need other help? I would answer that on, uh, on two things. Uh, one, uh, we had uh, uh, meetings uh, with the Disclosure Scotland and uh, Disclosure Services to, discu to discuss support packages, uh, including uh, training, uh, etc. Uh, and that was a very positive meeting. Uh, can I say that the link from Sports Scotland into football uh, is via the, the SFA. But at a very positive meeting with the Minister for Sport and the Minister for Children and Early Learning, Mr MacDonald, uh, the Minister for Sport, uh, I raised the concern about the interface with Sport Scotland. Uh, and in correspondence, I think it's come here, uh, she has uh, agreed uh, that uh, that channel will be opened up. So are you basically telling the committee now that you are willing to accept any help and all help in order to resolve? Currently, you know, you're the fall guy. You know, basically, are, are you going to ask for this help? Are you going to refuse the help? Are you going to take the help? We will always uh, sit down. Uh, we will always put... That's not what I'm asking. Well, I, if I could just get to the, to, to the actual point... We will all, always uh, get involved uh, in audit procedures. We've passed the SFA audit. We've passed the Disclosure Scotland audit. And that will lead to the support package, which we will accept. That's not what I'm asking you. So you can do that. I'm asking you, will you accept any and all help from any organisation in order to resolve this? Yes or no? Any relevant help, yes. Yes. Can I ask you, and, 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 and this may be uh, straight to the matter, do you, you seem to me a person who likes to have control. Do you have too much control? Are you, are you vetting every paper that crosses your um, staff's desk, or are you letting the staff go on with it? The staff have uh, functions to perform. They go on with it. So you don't personally vet every form that comes no, across your desk? No, it would be, phys physically, uh, it would be physically impossible. And that was why, in answer to, to a previous question, that, that we had to restructure. Uh, because uh, the blockage, sometimes a blockage would occur uh, if I wasn't there. So it was a case of getting the right staff in, which we now have, uh, and getting them in and empowering them to make decisions which wasn't there before, especially during the period I wasn't there. Okay, thanks. You said you'd passed the SFA audit, is that correct? Yes, in terms of the audit that has been carried out, as I said, year one has been a very soft touch audit as far as implementation of policies and the implementation of um, 
initiatives across a range of governance areas. Explain so, to me a soft touch audit. Um, the, the having a policy in place <coughs> as opposed to us going through and investigating how that policy is actually operating in practice. It's uh, extremely soft. So if you have a policy in place, tick the box? No, for, for year one, and it was made very clear that the governance audit has been introduced um, as a new initiative about 18 months ago. And because different organisations were in different places as far as their governance was concerned, what we wanted was to get everybody up to a level. And therefore, the first level was to demonstrate that they had a range of policies and procedures in place. That has been carried out, and all of our organisations, bar one, have actually completed that first audit. Moving forward, we then have the ability to identify gaps, and that's where we will start to look into the implementation of those uh, procedures and policies. Could I suggest that it's a fairly low bar, that audit, that, geez, you would need to be you know, outstandingly incompetent not to have policies in place? Fair in terms of implementing a brand new system from scratch, what you want is to get every part of the game into the same place. And as we said previously, many of these organisations are volunteer organisations. We've helped them put in place those policies. We've helped them write, in many cases, the procedures that need to be in place. And now we're looking at the execution and the implementation of those procedures. So year one was literally getting to a level. Mm. Donald. Thank you. Um, good morning. And <clears throat> following up, the questions that Richard Lyle asked about governance and the relationship between the SFA and SYFA. If you thought there was a serious problem, I'm asking this of the SFA, if you thought there was a serious problem with something, anything, that the SYFA was doing in terms of its activities, do you have the powers to step in and, for <coughs> example, suspend its activities, uh, take um, some kind of control of the board of or, or, or the employees within SFA? SYFA. Do you have those powers? Yes, we do, but there's a process. What you don't do is jump straight to the sanction, which would be the, the sanction you men mentioned, which is suspension. You would follow a process, which is investigation, review. It would go through our compliance officer. It would be investigated by and, and dealt with by an independent panel. And one of the range of options might be suspension if there was a serious breach of our articles or rules. Um, so, as I said, we have those powers, yes, to answer the question, but there's a process to follow. Have you used those powers? Yes, we have. Okay. And, and I, I accept this is a how long is a piece of string question, but how long normally does that process take? It depends on the breach. I mean, if there is a breach with, um, uh, with, with one of our members, it could take one or two weeks. If there is a more serious breach, it could take several months. It depends on the nature of the issue. But yes, we, oper we have a compliance officer and an independent judicial panel meeting every single week for variety of football-related and non-football-related non matters. Okay, can, I, can I just add to that? There's, there's obviously an, there's an, you asked about timescales. There's obviously an appeals process. You'd expect any process. There's the first hearing, an appeals process, usually heard by a judge. And then we have been judicially reviewed by our membership in the past, and we're certainly not in control of that. But that is why we need to make sure that we follow that <laughs> process absolutely properly so that we don't open ourselves up to judicial review. I accept that. But if, I mean, I'm actually talking about something slightly bigger than just the, a problem with a member. I mean, I, if you thought there was a real um, systemic issue with what one of your bodies, the SYFA or the amateur bodies, do you have the powers to, to step in and, and, and basically <coughs> take control? Yes, we have the power to step in. In terms of take control, that is the end of the process if there was a significant issue. But within that, there could be a range of issues. If it's criminal, then it's a police matter. Um, and clearly, we would pass that matter across to the relevant authority. If it's a, 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 a substantial or a serious breach of the rules, then yes, we have the ability to step in. If it's a financial failure, for example, we could step in. Given the evidence that we've heard previously, um, I have to say, Mr Little, I, I've been struggling to work out whether, as Richard L says, that you're the fall guy or whether your organisation is well-meaning and incompetent or whether there's something deeper, deeper problem within your organisation. 
Uh, am I wrong on all three fronts there? I think my, my uh, three options I've put to you. Am I wrong? I, I think uh, yes. In respect of competence of the organisation, I, I think uh, I think you are wrong. Uh, I, I think uh, we we always carry out due diligence. Uh, we have uh, a very good uh, range of, of skills on our boards and on our, our working groups. So I, I would certainly uh, dispute that. Uh, I am big and ugly enough to take uh, responsibility. Uh, and I think that uh, during this, uh, this period, uh, most certainly uh, my personal position uh, caused, uh, caused difficulty. Uh, hence the reason that, uh, that we had to restructure. So I think we've, we've taken care of that. I don't think there's a, a competition. Caused difficulty. Uh, in 2015, I went on holiday. Second day of my holiday, uh, I was diagnosed with cancer. Uh, during 2016, uh, I was going through uh, chemotherapy. They discovered uh, that I had also tumours on my, my liver uh, and had to go into to Edinburgh, followed by further chemotherapy. So at that particular time, uh, with all due respect, I was, I was out of the loop. I and, and can I say, in respect of that, that was why we had to restructure so that there was there. So the answer to your first point, yeah. Forgive me for, answer, uh, for asking that, but I, I, you know, no. I, I didn't mean to have to, to declare it, public information about your health, and yeah, I, I apologise for that. No, no, uh, it, it, was, it was one of the major contributory factors. I, I, and at that particular time, uh, the, the kind of governance before the restructure uh, was that the, the, the lady w that was the PA at that particular time was allowed out to, to visit me every second Wednesday for an hour and 15 minutes. I, and, and I discovered during that, uh, that period that it was going to be an hour and 15 minutes uh, because when my wife came back, that was that, that meeting finished. So that was unacceptable. But can I say, uh, and I'm not being flippant here, but one of the best cures outside the NHS is daytime television uh, because it enabled me to pick up a pad, uh, uh, especially when, when my wife wasn't about, uh, and write things down. Uh, and during that period, we did restructure, and that has... If you pardon the pun, that's cured an awful lot of the elves. Ask final thing. Um, what is the uh, what's the turnover of your organisation? Financial turnover. Financially, uh, it'll be run about four hundred thousand. Four hundred thousand. Okay. Any other questions people want to raise? No. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your attendance this morning. Oh, sorry. Yes, sorry, Claire. Sorry. And I've got one more as well that I forgot about, Claire. Sorry. Oh, sorry, uh, thank you, convener. Um, obviously, this morning we've been talking about PVG, uh, but the <coughs> uh, Health and Sport Committee's inquiry was into child protection and sport. And during a previous hearing, we had the Children's Commissioner here who um, raised some very serious concerns, which I think certainly do stray into the realms of child protection. Um, and I would like to hear the, particularly the SFA's comments on uh, his concerns that he raised here where he spoke about, and I'm quoting here, the overall culture remains in professional football clubs that they have control over children and young people who are in their charge. Now, this was in regard to uh, children and young people signing contracts um, to, to play for clubs. Um, the use of the word control, I queried with the Children's Commission at that point in time, because I thought that was particularly strong language, um, and really did play into a power imbalance um, between children, their parents and uh, professional clubs and I would like to hear what the SFA feels their role is in that and what the SFA can do to redress that balance. Well, I think first of all, well I'd say that um, we were astonished at the Children's Commissioner's comments that suggested that the power vacuum that existed between clubs and vulnerable children somehow created an opportunity for um, predators 
paedophiles, call it what you will, to operate. There's absolutely no evidence to suggest that's the case. And the issues that we're dealing with um, are historical child sex abuse issues, and that's subject to a separate independent investigation. That wasn't the issue that, that I think the Children's Commissioner was alluding to, and it certainly wasn't the, the inference that I took from the, the information that he gave us at that hearing. It was about a power imbalance between clubs and children because of the the contracts they were, they were signing and because of the conditions attached to those that were being imposed on children and young people. Not about sexual or physical abuse, but about power imbalance, which in itself can be abusive. Well, certainly the, the language used and the inference in the correspondence suggested something different. As far as the comments you've made about the, uh, the power that clubs may or may not have over children. This has been the subject of a separate committee which has been running since 2010. And the Scottish FA and the SPFL and the clubs have made a number of changes to our procedures to actually improve the situation that the Children's Commissioner refers to. The Children's Commissioner actually presented at our convention on this subject and he was invited to actually come and visit a number of the academies to actually experience firsthand what, what goes on in an academy and the procedure that is followed. Um, the reference to contracts um, we feel is overstated. Um, we feel that some of the concerns are overstated and we've made those points very clearly and directly to the Children's Commissioner and we remain in dialogue on a number of those matters as we speak. I don't know if you want to add anything. I think I'd only, only add, I think I said it last time we were here, that I think it was Children First or NSPCC talked about making sure we got a culture that valued the children first. And we, we are very conscious of that. Some of the things we have brought in, for example, are a children's wellbeing panel so that where there are concerns, they can be looked at from a child's perspective. We've also brought in a, a youth congress. We're very, very aware of the fact that football's often seen as, you know, it's the, 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 the big committees that make decisions. We've brought in a youth, youth congress where we have um, young people who are going to help us to make decisions in Scottish football. One of them will look at governance type issues, uh, make decisions in Scottish football that take into account the views of young children. So we, we, are, we are cognizant of the fact that we need to improve that culture, a culture that values children, and we will keep, keep working on that. So for the record then, Mr. Regan, can, can you say that you do not believe there is a power imbalance? I don't believe there is a power imbalance. I think that there is um, pr processes and procedures that are in place that we're explaining and have continued to explain to um, the Public Petitions Committee. And we have made changes to try and deal with some of the concerns that have been expressed. You know, we have a difference between amateur football, professional football, and we have a pathway that is followed that's very clearly laid out for, for all parties. And we, we've made changes um, to that pathway to allow certain players to be released within 28 days, um, as opposed to players feeling or parents feeling that their children are uh, uh, signed up for, for longer than that. So we, we are making changes. I don't believe there's a power imbalance, no. Just the fact that you allude to players being released within 28 days when we're talking about children leaves me with uh, some concerns, but thank you for your answer. On a, a, a totally unrelated issue, and the only reason I'm asking it is because you're here in front of us and a number of um, colleagues from across parties I know have been involved in this issue. Um, and that's the issue of the um, releasing financial information on the amount of money that the SFA makes or profits from um, courses that are compulsory. I know that a number of MSPs have been involved in this issue and have tried to get that information. Can I ask just a straightforward question? Why wouldn't you release that information? Well, the, in, the, the Scottish FA effectively ploughs all of our revenue back into the game of football. So in order to operate a coaching department, a team of coaches, then we simply recycle that Can money. Can you then provide the committee with something that is transparent that we can Absolutely. see that. I've got no issue with thank providing you. information in that regard. Thank you. Yeah. Um, can I thank everyone for their attendance this morning and we'll suspend briefly uh, to allow the panel to leave. Thank you.
Uh, agenda item two uh, is an opportunity for the committee to discuss the recent fact-finding visits that took place in the Sport for Everyone inquiry. Um, on Monday the 27th of February, members visited Glasgow and the Highlands, uh, visits to Aviemore Primary School and the uh, Community Centre uh, at Canusey High School and the Bad Knox Centre. And in Glasgow, members were in Easter House and Drumchapel. Uh, in Easter House, the session was we had a session with um, people who had barriers to participation in sport. And then we visited the Phoenix Community Centre, which is a largely self-funded uh, operation. And then we went on to the Drum Chapel Community Hub. The following day in Edinburgh, uh, we had a further session with people who are experiencing uh, barriers to participation in sport in Muir Muirhouse. And other members attended the Spartans uh, Community Football Club. Uh, first of all, I'd like to put on the record our thanks to uh, the people in the community who assisted us in um, facilitating those visits. They were um, very, very uh, good visits, and uh, all the people who participated in our discussions certainly uh, gave us a lot of food for thought. Can I invite uh, comments from members so that we can put on the record um, some of the themes that emerged from our visits uh, for the inquiry? Who would like to go first? Donald. Okay, first. Well, <coughs> thank you, convener. I um, attended uh, at Avi Moore and King Usi, along with Mars Briggs and Marie Todd. Um, and I'd like to put on record my thanks for to both the um, uh, clerks uh, for organising it, but also the organisations we met, um, High Life Highland and those who worked in the Community Sports Hub uh, and Avi Moore Primary School and, and King Usi High School. Um, Various issues emerged, um, and I, I don't want to take up too much time, but um, I think there is an issue about the transferability of um, sports participation in a, a rural setting where community identities are, are perhaps uh, stronger than they might be in a very urban area, and the extent to which the, what the great work we saw in the Highland region could, could actually be transferred into, um, a, as I say, a very metropolitan or urban setting. Um, the uh, other point I would make is that, that if there is pressure, which there is, on, on funding, um, it struck me very much that we should emphasise participation over um, elite sports uh, and, and high performance. And um, the clubs that we spoke to said, look, um, it's more important to get people involved and we as clubs will pick up the high performers in due course as they come through the system. Um, I think that's an important point to make. The other point to make, and I don't know if this was reflected at, at Easter House, but there are obviously some very key individuals uh, upon whom a lot, a lot sits. And for instance, we saw the community sports hub officers um, who work for High Life Highland are obviously absolutely instrumental in keeping all the balls in the air, as it were. Um, and you know, again, I, 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 I hope that if there are funding pressures, that um, the powers that be recognise the importance of these these individuals, because I think they a lot, especially when you're talking about um, volunteers and, and a lot of organisations that rely on on volunteers, um, how how important these these individuals are. Um, anyway, that's enough for me. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else, Marie? I, actually, um, the guys up in King Yusi and Aviemore were very keen to highlight how hard they work on making it happen. What 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 they have, you know. I, I mean, I think we were all struck by how great the cooperation was between clubs and the local authority and education and you know health and it, it was really quite impressive and I think they were saying there were some things so I think regularly it, it, there it, it is put back to them that you couldn't do this down in the central belt you know it's easy for you guys in the highlands and actually I think that under acknowledges how hard they work at it and I think they were saying there were some things that could be done very easily in every school in Scotland. For example, in King Usi, they had the sports day and they invited all the local clubs in to give everyone a taster of the different sports available in the area. And every single school in Scotland could do that if they had the will. And one of the things that made the difference um, up in King Usi in terms of providing the will was that the headmaster very clearly recognised the uh, importance of sport participation in terms of attainment 
and valued it. So I think that could happen in any school in Scotland. Yeah, uh, Miles. Yeah, I just wanted to touch on some of the points both Marie and Donald said. Firstly, the passion we saw from, I think, every single person we met, um, I think was fantastic, just to see how they had been driving that, uh, particularly the two community sport hubs officers who had, I think, kept being referred to as the glue, which was holding all this together. And I think there was a real concern that if there were to be any budget restraints in the future, they might be under pressure to go and that's where I think all the good work potentially could be under jeopardy so I think maybe to to take that forward the youth leaders were also something which I was hugely impressed with all three of us um tried line dancing <laughs> to varying degrees of success um but the youth le uh, leaders which they had were providing classes um which actually I think the children had were getting more out of because they were young people leading those and I think that's a real opportunity for all schools across Scotland to be able to increase the amount of exercise going on during the school day so I hope that's something and on the Spartans visit which um, we did I think there's lots of issues around this in the future around what happens to children when they're not at school during the summer months um, and one of the biggest issues I think which I took away from that was this sort of holiday hunger which often takes place and then the access to <coughs> facilities not being there and you know whether or not the school estate should be open during the summer to provide for this so things like that I think um, we should be looking to take forward as well. Alex. Thank you convener I attended the visit to Muir House Millennium Centre which happens to be in my constituency um, we met with a number of local residents who are self-declared not engaged in sport in any way and we were trying to unpack over a series of discussions with those residents what it was that was the barrier and I, I think um, uh, and I'm sure I speak for other colleagues who were at the visit who were you know quite surprised that what came out certainly in my discussions and I know in other discussions was that the big inhibiting barrier was in fact embarrassment above all other things I was expecting uh, the cost or availability or um, inconvenience things like that but but no I mean time and again and and more than uh, more than a handful of the people I spoke to were, were citing embarrassment as the key inhibitor for them getting involved which I thought was very telling and I wondered if perhaps that would change the sort of approach that we took and and if there was a way we could distill and drill down into that <coughs> particular barrier Alison yeah, actually, there was a woman that I heard from in the Easter House, the first session, where we met those who were probably furthest away from taking part, and she said that, just the feeling that you had to put on a full face of makeup and your best lycra and get yourself into that gym where everyone was staring at everyone else, so she would prefer something more relaxed. Um, I think that first session, I did feel those people had real barriers. Some of the ones that we hear time and time again, cost, time... But one that um, I heard that I hadn't heard previously was people who were concerned about hurting or injuring themselves and then missing work because of it. So that, that was a new one to me. Um, they were very concerned that they wouldn't then be able to access any physiotherapy, that they could be out of action for months. It was the first time I'd heard that one. And I, yeah, I mean, I think that group had real difficulty engaging. There was a man who had epilepsy and arthritis. But even he, he you know, he was able to play snooker and pool and so and I, I think the whole social side there perhaps is massively important the rest of the day I think the thing that struck me we, we went on to visit the next chap in Easter House I mean he felt like a lone ranger to me but I couldn't decide either if he actually wanted help or if he was slightly resistant I don't know what others thought of that the, where Neil and I played table tennis by the way um, <laughs> badly um, um, so I, yeah I, I couldn't decide if if there was a reluctance there just because if he'd put so much into it and he didn't want it to be spoiled or lost um, and then we saw the sort of traditional community hub in the afternoon which I, I thought was really impressive I mean I've met Terry the table tennis player before and he, I, I, again I, I think We've got real characters in these mm -hmm. situations. You know, it, it all does seem to hinge around one person, and and if they weren't there, it'd be interesting to see what happens. So, mm -hmm. support is clearly needed. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah, uh, thanks, yeah. Convener. Um, yeah, if I could come in, I, I think the, the the gentleman at the Phoenix Centre in in Easter House was a remarkable man, 
in terms of his drive and his energy and it had single-handedly really driven that that uh, that whole project to the stage where it's it's just about to come to absolute fruition and be a centre where as you were saying Miles that is open and accessible outside of, of school hours and I, and I think he really does have to be commended for the amount of work that, he, that he's done what I uh, I found that the obviously the the conversation earlier on uh, in Easter House about uh, difficulties access in sport was really fascinating and like yourself Alison I heard heard some um some a uh, differing views about why it was difficult to access and people talking about perhaps if they had a buddy that went with them they would feel more reassured going into a gym or going out in a sports centre that they they really not accessed before it was quite daunting going into that environment um, as regards the afternoon um, the at uh, drum chapel sports hub um one of the link workers from the, the Deep End GP practices had uh, started up a group in that GP practice which had been to help, um, particularly at that point in time, women who were suffering from mild to moderate depression, agoraphobia, anxiety, who weren't getting out of the house and weren't socialising, and a group which they then set in the sports hub, but not with a sports focus, to, to get these ladies into a group setting and to try and encourage them to, to talk about their their problems and their issues and, and to socialise and that then has grown into a tennis club um, which was a the spoke about with such enthusiasm how this had been such a motivating factor to help them get back onto their feet get back out and be engaged with society and actually reduce their contact with health services because they were accessing sport and they were accessing socialisation. So I think there was real lessons there to be learned, particularly as the rollout of link workers goes on through th through the country over the next few years, about how perhaps some of those roles can be utilised. I think um, the, the the visits to Glasgow, there was a number of things came up in that. I mean, the whole there's a whole list of issues around people's lifestyle, people just too busy to to try to try and make ends meet than than have spare cash to go and spend on, you know, leisure activities, whether it's for them or their, their families. A lot of health issues, um, cost issues, uh, social isolation, uh, gender issues, and um, transport, and of course, the sort of wider societal issues around housing, environment, territorialism, all that kind of, uh, those social issues came up as well. I think that, that about the individual anchor people is key. I mean, um, you could see how um, if one or two people within some of these organisations um, fell under a bus, then they might wobble to the point of falling over. Um, hopefully not, because some of them have lots of individuals there who hopefully would take up the, uh, the take up the baton. But um, that is a that is a concern. I think that will be repeated across the country in a number of these uh, uh, organisations. I thought the um, the issue that came forward, particularly at Drum Chapel, was the social aspect of it, about being belonging to something and not necessarily want to be the next Andy Murray or, or whatever, but just being part of something, enjoying even watching sport uh, taking place and, and being amongst young people and older people was quite a significant uh, thing there. Um, one thing that struck me was um, the, the very strong relationship that they have with, uh, in Glasgow, particularly with Glasgow Life, that came across with our sports coaches, their um, uh, active schools coordinators. There seemed to be a really good, and I think that's kind of what you were saying in Highland as well, that that's good, but that links in, of course, to one of the issues that they were raising repeatedly was about the whole issue of funding, local government funding, where there's partnerships with local government and that is getting more precarious. So <coughs> that was my observations in uh, two minutes. Just what when you said what you said there, Neil. One of the things that they were doing in the Highlands to to maximise what they got for their money, um, which they were saying could also happen all around the country, was using these young leaders um, to deliver um, sports and you know courses and things like that. So, so the the children, you know, at, at the higher level in school, were getting a chance to take on a leadership role. They were getting accreditation for the work that they were doing and providing essentially a free resource to the organisation in terms of delivering classes. And they were being in, you know, incredibly innovative. And when we saw from the written evidence a couple of weeks ago, this is it's young kids from school who are delivering dance courses by VC to islands. It's incredible. So you know, they're facing the same resource challenges 
but they're doing something really creative with it up north. Yeah. Okay, we've captured loads of information from the visits as well, so it was just really to reflect on some of the themes that came forward, but um, it was certainly helpful to inform our work and we'll uh, continue with that over the next few weeks. Okay, as agreed, we'll now move into private session. <laughs>